Hello and welcome to the education think piece titled Education is Political, Navigating the Humanitarian Development Nexus in Forced Displacement Contexts. My name is Mary Mendenhall and I am a faculty member in the International and Comparative Education Program at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. I have been working in the field of education and emergencies since 2005, initially with the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, then the International Rescue Committee, and now with Teachers College. My work examines refugee education and teacher management policies and practices in camp, urban, and resettlement contexts. Interestingly, my doctoral research focused on education and the humanitarian development gap. This was many years ago now, but some of the same challenges persist. Actors in both humanitarian and development organizations work hard to affect change in programs and policies that help reduce suffering and poverty and contribute to peace. Some of these efforts have been challenged by the humanitarian development gap caused by different ways of working within different types of organizations, challenges for education staff to think about and do work that is both short-term and life-saving and also longer-term and life-sustaining, not to mention some of the challenges related to donor policies, project timelines, and sources of funding. It is helpful to see how our thinking about the gap has changed over time and some of the positive improvements. In the 1980s, we aimed to bridge the gap by linking humanitarian relief and development. The 1990s focused on the relief development continuum. The 2000s saw the emergence of the cluster system and in recent years, the humanitarian and development spheres have focused on resilience. Today's reforms, inspired by the World Humanitarian Summit, focus on the ongoing quest to find new ways of working. The idea behind new ways of working is that our collective approaches should bridge humanitarian action, development, peace, and security, especially given the realities of today's protracted global displacement. This approach acknowledges that humanitarian and development actors need to collaborate side by side at global and country levels. Different reform efforts allow us to reflect on our work and think about new, better ways of responding. The new way of working aims to set a path for contributing to shared outcomes of reducing humanitarian need, risk, and vulnerability through a range of well-aligned, short, medium, and longer-term contributions by humanitarian and development actors. The new approach is not without its critics which are also worth noting. Some opponents express concerns about reforms that have been undertaken too quickly, that fail to address the weaknesses of the humanitarian system. Others are concerned with how we can uphold core humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, and independence with the linkages to peace and security objectives. These are real concerns and require attention. However, I would argue that education is always political and that it's not something we can shy away from, though of course we must be cautious, aware, and sensitive to the larger environment in which we are working. Whether we are creating safe learning environments for children, helping young people develop literacy, numeracy, life, and work skills to better understand what is happening in their communities and societies and how to contribute, helping them heal from trauma and get psychosocial support, provide teaching and learning materials, recruiting teachers with diverse backgrounds, making curriculum revisions to subjects or content areas that may have been manipulated by different parties, 
or engaging in gender sensitive, inclusive education or conflict sensitive education approaches, our work is inevitably political. Years ago, when the field of education and emergencies was really starting to form and get stronger, there was recognition that education reconstruction begins at the earliest stages of a crisis and should be undertaken concurrently with humanitarian relief. This remains true today. There are many issues that we could talk about when we think about education and the humanitarian development nexus. For this think piece and webinar, we will look at a few select illustrative examples related to learners, teachers, and education actors. Once children, adolescents, and youth are able to access education, an important issue comes up about how to recognize and validate their learning so that it is recognized in home, host, or resettlement countries, depending on who we are talking about, refugees, IDPs, host community learners. With the push towards inclusion of refugees into national systems and the nature of protracted crises, it's important to think about these policy and practice issues early on. As education specialists are designing programs and working with national education authorities, it's important to ensure access to national education systems through flexible ID and other documentation requirements for refugees, IDPs, and returnees. To facilitate access to national examinations, to develop regional and national policies to recognize learners' qualifications, recognition and equivalence, and leverage digital technologies to capture and share student learning in alignment with national systems requirements. A very promising development in this area and in the Eastern and Southern African region in particular is the Djibouti Declaration on Regional Refugee Education, which calls for this recognition of learning. The countries who have signed on to this work include Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and Uganda. Perhaps some of you have been involved in the development of this exciting policy. The Djibouti Declaration also pays attention to teachers, including refugee teachers, in a way that most policies and agreements do not, which is equally exciting. With this policy and through other efforts, education specialists and their partners need to work with national authorities early on to establish agreed teacher professional development and certification pathways engage in regional and cross-border discussions and agreements to recognize and validate teacher education and teacher trainings, and influence teacher management policies around work permits and compensation. Again, there are many other issues that need to be addressed, often simultaneously, such as who's paying teachers, how much are teachers being paid across different organizations, the question of whether or not national systems and national budgets will be able to absorb newly hired and trained teachers, which goes to show that there is even more need for coordinating these efforts across humanitarian development and national actors in both the short term and the long term. To help facilitate these processes, education specialists need to engage education authorities at national, district, and other levels in strategy and policy development, and engage other relevant actors, including ministries of finance, labor, and the interior, to name some examples, to ensure multi-ministry understanding and participation for both short and long-term planning. And what is sometimes a missed opportunity is how to better coordinate teacher professional development activities with national teacher educators and teacher training institutes and colleges. 
there's interesting work happening around teacher professional development provided by both UNICEF and its partners. Without a link to national teacher educators, we are unable to build in more sustainable approaches and affect system-wide change. Of course, UNICEF and its partners would also benefit from the knowledge and skills that these local resource persons have to offer as well, particularly around the curriculum, education policies, and other related areas. So those were just three illustrative examples of how UNICEF and its partners can engage national actors earlier in the process to improve the recognition and validation of learning and professional development for learners and teachers in displacement settings. There have been many efforts and successes to improve coordination, but it does continue to prove challenging, and there's always more that we can do to improve our collective and collaborative work. So how can we continue to strengthen coordination and planning? First, if we are asking education specialists to think both about the short term and long term and to work across the humanitarian development nexus, then these individuals also need support and capacity development opportunities. When I did research on this topic years ago, I remember an NGO colleague telling me that it was very difficult for her staff to make the transition from the urgency of the acute crisis and rapid service delivery to a more steady, comprehensive, and long-term approach where national governments needed to lead the way. This work requires a different mindset and different skills for short and long-term planning engaging effectively with national authorities and other partners, and having the requisite skills around communications, conflict sensitivity, risk-informed programming, diplomacy, consensus building, and negotiation. Second, organizations have different mandates, some of which are more humanitarian-oriented, while others are more development-oriented. UNICEF bridges that divide by working across the humanitarian development nexus. UNICEF's role in the education cluster provides an important platform and venue for bringing together different stakeholders. UNICEF's involvement in local education groups, LEGS, can help the organization and international, national, and local partners ensure stronger coordination and program alignment. There are different coordination mechanisms in humanitarian and development work. Within the humanitarian cluster system, implementing organizations coordinate among themselves, but there's no donor coordination within the sector. In development, local education groups coordinate donors and other larger actors supporting government programs, but not the diverse range of implementing organizations working in the sector. These distinctions can be confusing for both national governments and implementing organizations. UNICEF's mission and work across the humanitarian development nexus can play a key role in mitigating some of this confusion and building strong partnerships. Third, as the field of education and emergencies looks more closely at the data available and how we can strengthen the evidence base to support program and policy development, we need to bridge the gap in what types of data different organizations are collecting, how it can be more inclusive of longer term planning and development needs. There are some exciting efforts underway in this space but UNICEF should remain engaged and has a role to play in bringing the field together around data and evidence. The steps that need to be taken, whether there are current supports in place or not, can be overwhelming, especially among the many demands on education specialist time. But staff can use some of these critical reflection questions included in the think piece to create a space to have these conversations with UNICEF staff, cluster partners, national actors, and beyond. 
Leads for country level education clusters could facilitate critical discussions with diverse stakeholders to encourage humanitarian development thinking early in their response planning. You can adapt these questions to your purposes, tackling one issue at a time as needed. Answering questions such as what decisions or decision making frameworks can be made during early humanitarian responses to ensure recognition and transferability of learning and or training attained during displacement, or how can national education authorities be supported to examine and share both the challenges and the opportunities present in their education system for improved policies and practices for displaced learners and teachers might uncover gaps or challenges that weren't obvious but that could be overcome with a little extra effort. Here are additional questions for reflection. Thinking about what additional skills education specialists might benefit from in their efforts to work across the humanitarian development nexus would be helpful for strengthening human resources. Thinking about how we might create time and opportunity to more directly examine and reflect on our work in the humanitarian development space and cluster meetings and other gatherings would help all stakeholders think about this work even more. Broader systemic changes are needed, but we also cannot underestimate the changes that can be made by committed education specialists poised to move things forward. At the end of the day, we know how critical education is to the lives of those affected by different types of crisis. We know that we face many challenges in our collective work to provide quality education to all. We cannot afford to waste time, money, or other resources when stronger coordination and implementation of those plans over the longer term can make a big difference in reaching more learners and teachers in crisis around the world. I hope that you have enjoyed today's presentation and that it has provided ideas to reflect on as well as possible steps to take with your education teams and partners. I encourage you to review the full think piece for more details, helpful resources, and a list of citations referenced in this webinar. Thank you.